Hey guys, in this video, the lovely team is going to be talking to you about the UK Parliament. This is all for your GCSE in citizenship. Now, there are lots of names and complicated bits that you need to remember in this video. So to help you do that, over on my website, there are loads of multiple choice questions just waiting for you. United Kingdom, Westminster in London, is what we call bicameral. It has two houses an elected lower house, the House of Commons, which is often abbreviated HOC, and an unelected upper house, the House of Lords, HOL. Other countries sometimes have a unicameral parliament where there is only one house. Very rarely you see tricameral parliaments, which have three. The overall function of parliament in the UK is to debate on matters of the day, to examine government policy and legislation proposed by the government, to amend legislation where parliament feels it is necessary and is able to do so. And lastly, and most importantly, Parliament votes on the legislation put forward by the government. They hold the government to account in these ways. Should the government put forward legislation and it fails to pass through a vote of Parliament, it cannot become law. Should they be able to get it through votes in the House of Commons, the government is able to either create new law or amend existing laws in line with their policies. Each of these 650 MPs in the House of Commons is directly elected in their constituency. They are the Member of Parliament for that constituency. The House of Commons is overseen by a Speaker who is elected by the MPs. To become Speaker, therefore, one tends to need to have the support of MPs on both sides of the House. As a result, Speakers are almost always a conciliatory and well-liked figure. However, as their time runs on, if they're seen to be biased to one side or the other, they may lose the support of the House. The Speaker has several roles. They call different MPs to speak. To speak in the House of Commons, an MP needs to catch the Speaker's eye. They announce votes, formerly known as divisions, where they invite MPs to join the lobby which best conforms with how they view this piece of legislation. The Speaker is responsible for the conduct of MPs. They enforce the rules and make sure that MPs follow them. By tradition, MPs loyal to the government or of the government party sit to the right-hand side of the Speaker in the House of Commons. These are known as the government benches. Opposition MPs sit to the Speaker's left on what are known as the opposition benches. There are very strict rules governing the conduct and language of debates in the House of Commons. For example, when an MP is referring to another MP of the same party, they should use the phrase, my honourable friend. If that MP is legally qualified, it should be my learned friend or my learned colleague. Proceedings in the House of Commons are televised and have been since the 1980s, and a record of speeches is kept on the official parliamentary record known as Hansard. The House of Commons has several functions. Members of the Commons vote on the proposed government legislation, as we've described. However, before doing this, they debate the issue. This is done in an effort to sway MPs, who currently have no particular opinion, to their side, to challenge the government to justify its proposed legislation, and to examine it in detail. As proceedings in the House of Commons are televised, debates on key legislation are a way for MPs to get noticed. Members of Parliament known as whips who work for all parties, there are government whips and opposition whips, attempt to ensure, through persuasion and cajolement, that their MPs vote in the manner that their party leaders wish them to. Occasionally, on some matters, usually religious matters, there will be a vote of free conscience or a vote of conscience, sometimes also known as a free vote, where the whips take no part and they allow MPs to vote how their conscience tells them without party loyalty. These are rare, however. Ministers also make statements to the House. In doing so, after they've made their statement, they will take questions from MPs. This is done in order to hold the government to account and examine the actions of ministers. MPs also sit on what are known as select committees, in which experts in particular policies, which is MPs which have a particular interest in that area, will examine legislation in detail. They'll question ministers and public figures on that area and they will expect prompt answers. Many ministers comment that it is not Parliament itself which is, which is scary, it is select committees where MPs who may not be active in other areas, who may have a low public profile, will be forensic in the examination of their particular area. If we take an example piece of legislation, the Marriage Same-Sex Couples Act 2013 made full marriage legally allowed in the United Kingdom between same-sex couples. It was proposed by the Conservative Liberal Democrat Coalition, which came to power following the hung Parliament election of 2010. This piece of legislation was controversial to many religious or socially conservative MPs, that is, those MPs who believe in traditional gender and sexuality roles. It, there was therefore a question about whether the government would be able to get this piece of legislation, which was widely popular in the country, especially with young people, through Parliament. As it happened, although many Conservative members of Parliament voted against the Act, most of the Labour benches, Liberal Democrats, 
SNP, Plaid Cymru and Greens, did, which gave the piece of legislation a total number of votes for of 395 and total votes against of 170. As is often the case, several MPs abstained. This may be because they did not have a particular opinion, they felt they should vote in a certain way but their conscience did not let them, or they were unable to attend Parliament. As a result, this legislation passed where it was examined in other areas of Parliament and in the House of Lords, and eventually it received royal assent, which is the Queen's tacit approval, and became law. Royal assent is required for any piece of legislation to become law, although these days it is mostly a formality, and there has not been a recent case of the Queen refusing to give royal assent to a piece of legislation. The House of Lords comprises 787 peers, or Lords, both terms are applicable. There are 26 Lords spiritual, who are senior figures from the Church of England, usually bishops. The main members of the House of Lords, however, are the Lords Temporal, who are appointed by political parties. One thing to note here is that traditionally many members of the House of Lords have been hereditary peers, where that title has passed down through hereditary from father to son or father to daughter. However, uh, following the new Labour government 1997 onwards, they have been gradually phased out, and as ones have passed away, then their numbers have gradually thinned to almost none. Usually, appointment to the Lords is made by party leaders, especially the Prime Minister, and it can be one of two things, either a reward for long service. For example, Prime Ministers upon retirement tend to be elevated to the House of Lords. They vary in how active they are there. Margaret Thatcher in particular was very active. Not all Prime Ministers go to the Lords. Sometimes their party does not feel that it is worth it. Sometimes they do not want to. Sometimes, however, elevation to the House of Lords is an easy way for a Prime Minister or party leader to remove a difficult colleague from the House of Commons, one who may perennially vote against them, for example. It's very difficult for an individual to turn down an elevation to the House of Lords. Lords has several functions, but its primary function is to review and amend legislation as it sees fit. It is theoretically able to completely reject a piece of legislation coming from the government. However, there are severe limits on this power, and the House of Commons, being elected, can override it. Generally, the House of Lords takes the view that because the House of Commons has been elected, its say goes above the House of Lords. However, many of the House of Lords have a specific area of expertise. They may be very qualified or experienced in their industry or field of research, for example, very senior doctors, judicial figures, or experienced military people. They will have a special interest in legislation which concerns their area and may bring valuable insight to amend it. There are many problems with Parliament as it is today, and it's very important in an exam to be able to put these problems forward and evaluate the effect that they have. The buildings of Parliament are physically antiquated. The building is in growing disrepair and has limited infrastructure for the modern age. It was only in the 1970s and 80s that most MPs had their own office. In such an old and decrepit building, installing proper plumbing and broadband facilities has been a challenge. There is still a lack of diversity. Most MPs and Lords are still male, are still white, are still graduates from the upper and middle classes, and most of them, especially on some benches, are still wealthy. To the general public, therefore, this means when they look at Parliament, it doesn't reflect the society they see around them. The customs found in Parliament are antiquated. We looked earlier at the language one must use in the House of Commons referring to my honourable friend. That does not relate to the experiences of many of the British public. Electability is also an issue. The House of Lords is unelected. It has limited accountability and it's therefore debatable to what extent it has a mandate from the general public. In many other countries, their upper house is elected. For example, in the US, senators are elected to serve in the Senate. We therefore know it is possible to have an elected upper house, and the extent to which the House of Lords should, if at all, be elected has been a running debate in British politics since the 1970s. Traditionally, Conservative governments have favoured keeping the House of Lords as it is, although some have been more open to reform. Traditionally, Labour governments have pursued a more reformist policy to the House of Lords. Parliament is in London. It's seen as London-centric, with little experience of the world and the problems in that world outside of the capital. To many people in London, Parliament seems very close and relevant to them. But to people in the north of Scotland or the far west country, Parliament is many hundreds of miles away and therefore of very limited relevance.